Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Maria Caulfield. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Right Honourable Jones a bit ahead of himself. There's a process to be followed. Wait his turn. Well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As always, uh, the Prime Minister is attending the G7 in Japan. I've been asked to reply on his behalf. This morning, I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I will have further such meetings later today. I'm sure member, members opposite will disagree, but the first priority of any government has to be the defence and security yeah. of our country. Yeah. Therefore, could the Chancellor outline for me the steps that this government is taking to replace our trident nuclear defence? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The first duty of government is to defend the country. And for almost 70 years, an independent nuclear deterrent has provided the ultimate insurance of our freedom. We will review our Trident deterrent, we will bring forward votes in this House, and we ask MPs from all sides of the House to support this vital commitment to our national security. And when she stands up, the Honourable Lady representing the Labour Party should indicate that support today. Trident and you should get on with it. Yeah. Now, yeah. Mr. Speaker, given the overnight news of the French authorities' dawn raid on Google investigating allegations of aggravated financial fraud and money laundering, does the Chancellor now regret calling his cosy little tax deal with the same company yeah. good news for the British yeah. taxpayer? Yeah. Well, it is good news that we are collecting money in tax from companies that paid no tax when the Labour Party was in office. And she seems to forget that she was the Exchequer Secretary in the last government. So perhaps when she stands up, she can tell us whether she ever raised, with the inland revenue at the time, the tax affairs of Google. I think obviously uh, the Chancellor has done a bit more of his research this time, and uh, I, I regard that as a compliment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think, I, think, I think from that answer that the Chancellor is far too easily satisfied yeah. with his current tax. I note, Mr Speaker, that even the Honourable Member for Uxbridge and Ryslip labelled his cosy little deal derisory, and the British public think it's even worse. So despite all the rhetoric, on his watch, the tax gap has actually gone up. His tax deal with the Swiss raised a fraction of the revenue he boasted that it would, and the OBR blames the lack of resources in revenue and customs. So why, Mr Speaker, has he sacked 11,000 tax staff since 2010? And when is he going to give them the resources they need to do a proper job? Well, we increased resources for the HMRC to tackle tax evasion and avoidance. We've introduced a diverted profits tax, so companies like Google can't shift their profits offshore anymore. We've made sure the banks pay a higher tax charge than they ever did under the last Labour government. But I come back to this question. She was a Treasury Minister. She stood at this dispatch box. She's asking me, she's asking me what we've done to tackle tax evasion and tax avoidance. Did she ever raise as the Exchequer Secretary, the tax affairs of Google, we should know this before she asks questions of this government. Uh, members must calm themselves and remain calm. They should take order. 
On both sides, they should take the lead from the right honourable and learned gentleman, the member for Rushcliffe, who, as always, is sitting <laughs> calm <laughs> in a statesmanlike manner. That's the way to behave. Angela Eagle. Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, we all have a great deal of respect for the right honourable member for Rushcliffe. Um, now, the Chancellor of the Exchequer will know that the Exchequer Secretary deals with taxes on vices, uh, not Google. And I did my job in taxing vices when I was in the Treasury. Now, he will be judged on results. On results. He's been in office for six years. And with France demanding ten times more from Google than he is, the public will make their own judgment. Mr Speaker, while Labour is campaigning to ensure that the UK remains in the European Union because it's the best way to defend rights at work, as well as jobs and prosperity, the party opposite is split right down the middle. into vicious acrimony. Now last week the employment minister last week Mr Speaker last week the employment minister called for Brexit so there could be a bonfire of workers' rights. Does the Chancellor agree with her or does he agree with Len McCluskey that a vote to stay in the European Union is the best deal for Britain's workers? Well first of all she confirmed that when she was in the Treasury, she asked absolutely no questions about the tax affairs of Google. When it comes to the, when it comes to the European Union, uh, as she knows, uh, we agree on this. I think it's better that Britain remains in the European Union. Why don't we have some consensus now on some other issues, like having an independent nuclear deterrent? Let's have a consensus on that. Let's have a consensus on supporting businesses rather than disparaging businesses. Let's have a consensus on not piling debts on the next generation, but dealing with our deficits. Let's have a consensus that the parties in this House should have a credible economic policy. I think he's just agreed with Len McCluskey. Yeah. Now, the former Work and Pensions Secretary, the former Work and Pensions Secretary, said this week that the Chancellor's Brexit report should not be believed by anyone, and he branded the Chancellor Pinocchio, with his nose just getting longer and longer with every fib. Now, uh, meanwhile, the General Secretary to the TUC said that the Treasury's report gives us half a million good reasons to stay in the European Union. Who does the Chancellor think the public should listen to? His former Cabinet colleague or the leader of Britain's millions of trade unionists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's, any, I don't think it's any great revelation that uh, different Conservative MPs have different views on the European Union. That's why we're having a referendum, because this issue does divide parties and families and friends, and we made a commitment in our manifesto that the British people would decide this question. And I might just observe that if she wants to talk about divisions in parties, while she's sitting here, the leader of the Labour Party is sitting at home wondering whether to impeach the former leader of the Labour Party for war crimes. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm glad that he agrees with Francis O'Grady. It's just a pity that he can't get half his backbenchers and most of his own party to agree with him. And given that the former Work and Pension Secretary has just called the Prime Minister disingenuous and the former Tory Mayor of London has called him demented, I wouldn't talk about <laughs> Labour splits if I were him. I'd get his own house in order before he talks about us. Now, Mr Speaker, following his second Omni Shambles budget earlier this year, I see the Chancellor's approval ratings have collapsed by 80 points amongst his own party. Now, Given that he seems to be following a similar career path, 
given that he seems to be following a similar career path, isn't it time he turned to Michael Portillo for advice? Last week, the former would-be leader said of the Queen's speech, after 23 years of careful thought about what they would like to do in power... Order, order. This question will be heard. Those prating away should cease doing so. It's stupid and counterproductive. Angela Eagle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After 23 years of careful thought about what they would like to do in power, Michael Portillo said, the answer is nothing. Absolutely. There is nothing they want to do with office or power. Now, the government has nothing to do, nothing to say, and thinks nothing, is what he said. But even this nothing Queen's speech has caused a revolt on his own backbenchers and forced yet another U-turn to avoid the first defeat of a government on its legislative programme for 92 years. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, doesn't that tell you all you need to know about this Prime Minister and Chancellor? It seems they can't even get their backbenchers to vote for the nothing without a bite. I'll tell you what we've done in recent weeks. We've taken another million people out of tax altogether. We've frozen fuel duty. We've cut business rates for small businesses. We've seen the deficit fall by another £16 billion. We've delivered a record number of jobs and we've introduced a national living wage. That's what we've been up to. And what have the Labour Party been up to? She talks of U-turns. They've turned the Labour Party from a party that gave Britain its nuclear deterrent to a party that wants to scrap it, from a party that created the Academies programme that now wants to abolish all academies, from a party that once courted businesses that now disparages it. The prawn cocktail offensive is just plain offensive these days. And as a result, they've gone from a Labour Party that won elections to a Labour Party that's going to go on losing those elections. Mr Speaker, with 29 days to go until the most important decision this country has faced in a generation, we have before us a government in utter chaos, split down the middle, at war with itself. The stakes could not be higher, and yet this is a government adrift at the mercy of its own rebel backbenchers, unable to get their agenda through Parliament. Instead of providing the leadership the country needs, they're fighting a bitter proxy war over the leadership of their own party. And I notice that no outer, all the Brexiteers have been banished from the front bench. Secretary here. I think the Chancellor has put the rest of his Brexit colleagues in detention. <laughs> Instead of providing the leadership the country needs, they're fighting a bitter proxy war over the leadership of their own party. Instead of focusing on the national interest, they're focusing on their narrow self-interest. What we need, Mr Speaker, is a government which will do the best for Britain. What we've got is a Conservative Party focused only on themselves. She talks about our parliamentary party. Let's look at her parliamentary party. They are like rats deserting a sinking ship. You've got the shadow health minister wants to be the mayor for Liverpool. You've got the member for Bury South wants to be the mayor for Manchester. The shadow home secretary wants to be the mayor for both cities. When we said, when we, said we were creating job opportunities, we didn't mean job opportunities for the whole shadow cabinet. <laughs> And they're, they're, like, they're like a parliamentary party on day release, aren't they? <laughs> when the Honourable Lady is here. But they know the member for Islington will be back, and it's four more years of hard labour. Yeah. Mr. 
Mr Speaker, today we are voting on a Queen's speech that delivers economic security, protects our national security, enhances life chances for the most disadvantaged. And it doesn't matter who stands at that dispatch box for the Labour Party these days. They're dismantling our defences. They are wrecking our economy. They want to burden people with debt. And in their own report, published this week, called Labour's Future, surprisingly long, they say this. They say this. In their own report, they are becoming increasingly irrelevant to the working people of Britain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What a privilege it is to be called by you, because if the Remain team have their day on the 24th of June, I shall have to apply by email to her younger to ask her question. <laughs> Airbus! Airbus, Mr Speaker! A wonderful example of European cooperation, no, European, not EU, with the fuselages built in France and Germany and the wings in this country. And planes cannot fly without wings, Mr Speaker. Whether you remain inside or outside the EU will have no effect on this business. For as the Chancellor knows, it is trade and hard work of businessmen and women who create jobs and prosperity, not politicians and bureaucrats. It is their job to nurture growth and enterprise. Uh, I was ordered! I was looking for a question mark. And does Bar Idol, my friend, agree with me? It is their job to nurture and not to make threats to business, enterprise, jobs and aspiration. Well, I completely agree with my honourable friend that jobs and enterprise are created through the ingenuity of private businesses that we should support and nurture in this House. Yeah. Angus Robertson. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Lachlan, Lachlan Brain is seven years old and he attends the Gaelic Medium Primary School in Dingwall in the Scottish Highlands. Next week, as the Home Secretary is currently briefing him, the Home Department plans to deport him and his family, despite the fact that he arrived as part of a Scottish Government initiative backed by the Home Office to attract people to live and work in the region. This case has been front page news in Scotland and been repeatedly raised in the House. What does the Chancellor have to say to the Brain family? and the community who want them to stay? Yeah. Well, as I understand it, the family don't meet the immigration criteria, but the, well, the Home Secretary says she's very happy to write to the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman on the details of the specific case. Mr Angus Robertson. I'm sorry, this has been going on for weeks, and that, yeah. frankly, is not good enough. Yeah. 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 Appeals have been made to the Home Secretary yeah. by the First Minister by the local MP, by the local MSP, by the community. It is wall to wall across the media of Scotland, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer clearly knew nothing about it. The problem in the Highlands of Scotland is not immigration, it has been emigration. So even at this late stage, knowing nothing about it, will the Chancellor speak to the Home Secretary, speak to the Prime Minister and get this sorted out? Yeah. Well, as I say, the Home Secretary will write to the Honourable Gentleman on the details of the case. But can I, but can I make a suggestion? Can I make a suggestion to the Scottish Nationalist Party? They now have very substantial tax and enterprise powers. And if they want to attract people to the Highlands of Scotland, why don't they create an entrepreneurial Scotland that people want to move to from the rest of the United Kingdom, where they can grow their business and have a successful life? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Why is the why is the Chilcot report not being published before the EU referendum? 
Is it because the Prime Minister and the Chancellor don't want the public to be reminded of how the government of the day and the establishment are prepared to produce dodgy dossiers, make things up and distort the facts to con the public into supporting something they otherwise wouldn't ahead of the EU referendum? Yeah. Uh, no, it's because it's an independent report and they decide when to produce that report. Stephen Pound, in the spirit of consensus, uh, Mr Speaker, may I say that there are few things that unite the House more than a concentration on the periodic reviews and of the Boundary Commission, which is being studied with a fierce intensity and covetous eyes are occasionally cast on neighbouring constituencies. However, we do note that the electorate of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and the City of Westminster has declined precipitously and against all logic. Does the Chancellor believe that the Prime Minister should be concerned about this? And if so, what should he be doing? <laughs> well, I thought he was the Member of Parliament for Ealing, but uh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, the, the, boundary, the Boundary Review are doing their work. They're drawing up in an independent way, which is a good thing about our country. The Boundaries, and we'll see their proposals, I think, later this year, their initial proposals. Garney! Thank you, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Will the Chancellor join me in congratulating Bernardo's, the UK's oldest yeah, yeah, and largest yeah, yeah. children's charity, yeah. which is this year celebrating 150 yeah, years yeah, of supporting yeah. and protecting vulnerable children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But does he agree that young people need support beyond the age of 18 to maximise their life chances, and that the government's new Care Leavers Covenant, which extends the duty of care to 25, is therefore a fitting way to build on Bernardo's proud history of giving young people the best opportunities in life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I certainly uh, agree with my honourable friend that Bernardo's is a brilliant charity and we should all congratulate them on the work they do. And also that we have a huge responsibility to the people who are in the care of the state and that responsibility does not end when they are 18 years old. And that's why in the Queen's speech we are announcing new measures to include, for example, support from a personal adviser until they're 25 and make sure that other bodies like local authorities have a care for those people and make sure that uh, all the opportunities are brought to their attention. It's part of the life chances strategy which lies at the heart of this Queen's speech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Chancellor wanted a march of the makers. Today, hundreds of steel workers are marching to Parliament for their future and their communities. Why does this government back China's bid for market economy status against the interest of British steel workers. Yeah. Why does this Chancellor block changes to the lesser duty tariff against yeah. the interest of British steel workers? And when will he set down an industrial strategy to put British steel workers' interests ahead of his own? Yeah. Well, look, the first thing I'd say is, of course, our thoughts are with the, the steel makers and their families in this very difficult time. And there is a if we, if we take a step back, I think we should all acknowledge in this House that there is a global crisis in the steel industry. The ten, tens of thousands of jobs have been lost just across Europe alone, and many tens of thousands beyond that. Now, we are taking specific action today to help Tata and the Port Talbot Works and the related works across the country. And my right hon. friend, the Business Secretary, has been there in India with the First Minister of Wales in a cross-party effort. And then, nationally, we have taken action to reduce energy charges on energy-intensive industries. We have taken action to make sure there's more flexibility with emission regulations, doing everything we can to help this industry in a very difficult time, including making sure there are are tough tariffs on Chinese dumping, and as a result of the tariffs that have been introduced on rebar steel, those imports are down over 90 per cent. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, could the Chancellor confirm to this House reports in the press today that former Labour Minister Lord Sugar has joined the Government as our new enterprise czar? Does he agree with me that this is a sign of people abandoning Labour for the prosperity, security and jobs offered by this Government? But will he finally confirm to me that he has no new plans for a sugar tax? <laughs> <coughs> Well, I, I can confirm that uh, we have hired uh, Lord Sugar to advise on enterprise, uh, and uh, he will bring his knowledge and expertise to that. And apparently, Lord Sugar has told the Labour Party, "You're fired." Cat Smith. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a 14-year-old autistic constituent who got on very well at primary school, but since the move to secondary school, has found the secondary school's uncompromising one-size-fits-all approach has left him with a special school being his only option. What will the Chancellor do to make sure that when the independent expert group looking at initial teacher training reports back, that ministers will ensure that specific autism training forms part of their curriculum? Yeah. Well, I think the uh, Honourable Lady does raise uh, an important issue, and I think she will have a lot of sympathy with, uh, from colleagues around the House. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the Education Secretary has raised her concern uh, and has, has shares her concern and has personally raised the issue with the chair of the initial teacher training review, Stephen Mundy. Uh, and my honourable friend has stressed the importance of ensuring teachers are properly trained to support young people with special education needs and specifically autism. And as a result, he will be including recommendations as to how core teacher training should cover special educational needs in this report. And this report will be published very shortly. Yeah. Yeah. McCartney. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. My local clinical commissioning group are currently consulting on their appalling plans to downgrade A&E at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. Will the Chancellor agree with me and thousands of hands-off HRI campaigners, led by Carl Deitch, that all options should remain on the table and that a Plan B must come forward to keep good quality local health services? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my honourable friend is a strong champion of his local area, and we all know that Huddersfield Royal Infirmary have been struggling with the PFI contract which they signed under the last Labour government. Now, any service changes by, need to be made by the local NHS, and they need to be based on clear evidence that they will deliver better outcomes for patients. It's right that these decisions are made by local clinicians rather than politicians, but they do need to meet the four key tests that have been set out. They need to demonstrate public and patient engagement, have the support from GP commissioners, be based on clinical evidence and consider patient choice. And I would expect the local NHS to consider all these options in any decision they reach. Patrick yeah. Brady. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The House of Commons Library estimates that 4.9 million UK citizens live or work in other countries. And yet, week in and week out at my surgeries, I meet constituents from overseas who can't get visas, residency or citizenship here. And the whole of Scotland is outraged at the threat and deportation of the Brain family. Yeah. Can the Chancellor tell us, in his view, what is the difference between an economic migrant and an expat? Well, I think all the honourable gentleman is demonstrating is that we do have border controls in this country, and we do have immigration rules that need to be complied with, and uh, that is a very important part of the European Union's uh, Schengen Area Agreement that we are not part of, and I think it's part of the special status we have in the European Union. And Marie Trevelyan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Would the Chancellor join me in welcoming the crew of HMS Duncan, yeah. our last and best of the Type 45 destroyers, presently moored in London for the Battle of Jutland commemorations, some of whom are watching from the gallery today? Um, and would he support the work that our all party group on the Armed Forces Covenant is doing to ensure all our armed forces and their families have the very best housing that we can offer them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I absolutely join her in uh, welcoming the crew of HMS Duncan and uh, celebrating all they do on behalf of this country to keep us safe and to represent Britain around the world. And of course, in return, we owe them a duty of care, and the Armed Forces Covenant enshrines that duty. No such covenant existed before we came into Downing Street. Now we're in Downing Street. We are honouring our promise to the Britain's armed services and to the Royal Navy. Julie Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not content with just trebling tuition fees, this Government wants to raise them even higher. Why has the Chancellor changed his view since 2003 when he said that tuition fees were a tax on learning? Well, back then, the Labour Party were voting for tuition fees. And the difference is... The difference is this, that we learnt our lesson and they've forgotten theirs. And as a result, we have a credible higher education policy that's giving us the best universities in the world, a record number of students, and crucially, a record number of students from disadvantaged backgrounds, something the Labour Party said would never happen. In return, they've got a completely incredible policy to abolish the tuition fees that they themselves introduced and create a £10 billion hole 
in the public finances. It's time they were straight with students that that's completely unaffordable, and we go on funding our higher education system and asking graduates who are going to earn more on average than other taxpayers to contribute to their education. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. St Albans and many areas in the south and east value their green belt. ONS figures say three million people may come into this country if we remain. Would he like to suggest which bits of the green belt, about a quarter of a million acres, will be needed and where will it go? We need to provide houses and homes and infrastructure for these people. Well, we've made a very clear commitment to protect the green belt and our planning laws that we've introduced and proposed to introduce uh, do meet those laws. But I have to say to, the, to the, my honourable friend, you know, we disagree on this issue of European Union membership, and I've seen no particular evidence from the Leave campaign that uh, immigration would fall. Indeed, they seem to be saying to some communities they'd let more people in. Uh, but let's at least uh, agree on this, that we have a referendum, and it's not going in the end going to be up to her or me, but the British people to decide. Leave Cummins. Here, here, here. Here, here, here. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No one should underestimate the public support for the BBC. In the last week, over 200,000 people signed a petition over the removal of the recipe's website. Yeah. Yeah. The government may have been forced to pull back from some of their more extreme proposals, but there's still plenty to cause concern. Will the Chancellor now agree to hold a debate and a vote on the floor of this House so that MPs can provide the parliamentary scrutiny that this Charter renewal so properly deserves? Yeah. 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 Well, we want a great BBC, a great public yeah. broadcaster, and we have uh, agreed a deal with the BBC that they have themselves uh, welcomed. Uh, on the specific issue she raises, that was an operational decision by the BBC, not a decision taken by members of the government. But I'd make this observation. We have a great national public broadcast in the BBC, but we don't want a great public newspaper in the form of the BBC. And as the newspapers move increasingly online, the BBC, as they have themselves acknowledged, want to be careful about what information they have on their website so that we can also have a flourishing private press. And I think the BBC have got that balance right. William Cash. Uh, will the Chancellor yeah. confirm and explain, as the House of Commons Library and the ONS figures for 2015 clearly show, that whereas we export 44% of our goods and services within the single market, why it is that in relation to the other 27 member states, we run a disastrous loss or deficit on these exports of 68 billion per annum, up 9 billion since last year alone, whereas Germany, with the same 27, runs a profit or surplus of a massive 82 billion. Isn't this a bad deal? Well, we are a massive exporter of services, and our services represent 80% of the British economy. And we're also the home to one of the most successful car industries in Europe, and we export cars to the continent. We're also home to the world's second largest aerospace industry, and of course, a part of a European supply chain. And that is why those uh, leading businesses are in favour of our membership of the European Union. But as I say to my uh, honourable friend, of course, we disagree on this issue, and that's why. Together, we stood on a manifesto to have a referendum and let the British people decide. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Head teachers, NHS and private sector employers in my constituencies, constituency are telling me they have few, if any, qualified applicants for a range of skilled roles and too many experienced staff are leaving. The single most common reason for this key worker crisis is the cost of rental and purchase housing in West London, which the government's housing policies will not address. Even the subsidies to buy... Order, 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 I'm sorry, order, order. Order. I'm sorry to say to the Honourable Lady, one sentence with a question mark at the end of it, and it had better be a short one. Sorry, but we must press on. Ruth Cadbury. Will the Chancellor acknowledge this recruitment and re retention crisis and do something about it? Yeah. Well, of course, we have got 20... 5,000 more clinically trained staff in our National Health Service, but I completely agree with her that there is a challenge of housing in London. I met with the new Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, earlier this week, and we're going to see where we can agree on policies that will help address that issue. Bernard Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my right honourable friend's enthusiasm, 
to bludgeon the British voter into supporting the European Union that they don't really like. Here it is. Um, and how can he justify planning to break the law? Is he aware that the Public Administration Select Committee has now published three legal opinions from Speaker's Council? From, from Speaker's Council. Order, order. I hope the sentence is coming to an end and there will be a question mark at the end of it. Very briefly. Is he aware that the Public Administration Select Committee has now published three legal opinions Senator. from Speaker's Council which make it perfectly clear that it is illegal for the Government to keep their pro-EU propaganda up on the Government websites during the PERDA period? One their facts and two it <clears throat> Well, of course, you know, the government will comply with the law and government websites will comply with the PERDA rules, and we're confident that they do. But can I make a general observation? He and I have fought for this referendum. The referendum is taking place. There are some huge issues at stake about Britain's economy, about Britain's security, about Britain's place in the world. We have perfectly honourable disagreements on those big issues. Let's debate the substance rather than the process, and then the British people will feel that they have had a range of opinions and they can make their own mind up. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The care sector faces a crisis made worse by the Chancellor's failure to properly fund increases in the minimum wage. The 2% social care precept does not cover all the costs, so the local government association asked the Chancellor to bring forward £700 million of better care funding from 2019 to this year and next year to help with those increased costs. Will the Chancellor listen to local councils and will he fund his own minimum wage policy? Yeah. Well, of course, we always listen to local authorities and are in dialogue with them, but we have given them the power, which many of them have used, to apply a social care precept, and that is something that's come in in April in many areas. At the same time, we put more money into the Better Care Fund, and we're confident that, therefore, social care is funded. But I agree with her that more needs to be done to help the social care sector, and I think the key here is going to be integration with the National Health Service over the coming years, so it's a much more seamless service for our citizens. Thank you. Last year at the Conservative Party conference, our right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, said that the future that we, the state, provide for children in care was shameful. The dole, an early grave, or the streets. Yesterday, the Prison Reform Trust, of which I'm a trustee, produced a report identifying that far too high a proportion of children in care come in touch with the criminal justice system. Will my right honourable friend and the Prime Minister ensure, right across government, that policies are implemented that prevent the unnecessary contact between the criminal justice system and children in care so that they can have a good future? Well, I think my right honourable friend speaks very powerfully, and of course we've got to have a care system that does the very best for children who find themselves in that care system. And uh, as I was saying in reply to an earlier question, the Queen's speech has measures in that respect. The other thing we're doing uh, with my run on friend, the Lord Chancellor, is reforming our prison system so that people, yes, are punished for crimes, but they also have a chance to rehabilitate themselves. And that is one of the social reforms I'm proudest to be part of. Finally, Dr. Alan Whitehead. Uh, a Southampton letting agency has recently been banned from trading for three years for not giving tenants their uh, deposits back and using them for other purposes. The, uh, the situation, however, as far as uh, letting agencies are concerned, is that they are almost completely unregulated and it's pot luck whether Southampton residents actually get a fair deal from their letting agents or not. Is the Chancellor intending to do anything about this? Well, we, we are looking at what we can do to make sure that uh, people who rent do have proper consumer protection, including protection from landlords who unreasonably withhold deposits. Order.